what's my T? There we go. Uh, is just to get your name first and last and the correct spelling so I have it on tape. Okay. So if you go ahead and uh, spell it. Yes, please. C A R L T O N Z E U S K E. Zuski. Zuski. Yeah. Actually, real pronunciation is Zoyski. Zoyski? But in the army, they always called me Zuski because Zeus is in key. See, I just went along with it. But it's a German name, Zoyski. See, see, see which is interesting because I've talked to, to some people about this being of German descent myself. Yeah. You know, people didn't look at us and say, oh, we need to lock all the Germans up. But yeah. boy, if you were Japanese, that was a yeah. totally different. Uh, that was a, yeah. I was with the, near that 442 regiment that, boy, they fought in Italy, especially south of Rome, that town that changed hands 12 times one day. And they was the last unit to go in, they held her. We, God, they, yeah. Yeah, it's, it was an interesting, and I'm learning, you know, I've learned so much about it. It's, it's such an interesting, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of um, a dilemma to it. Where did you grow up? Shano, Wisconsin. Really? Yeah. A cheesehead. Yeah, right out of Green Bay. Yeah. Yeah, it's 35 miles west of Green Bay. And you you know what cheese curds are. Yeah, there. oh, God, I got some home now, they said. <laughs> I, have a, I have a good buddy from Madison. Yeah. Oh, the, you can't beat that good brick cheese. Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. So now, how, how old were you when you got in the service? Uh, 20, uh, let's see, I went in June 42. I was 20, uh, 19, uh, uh, 23. So you'd finished high school and... Yeah, yeah, and then I went into, I got no... But you know, I I got the job at 38, I got out of high school. So, God, you couldn't buy a job, depression, jeez. I mean, you went down there, then if you were single, get out of here. It was tough times there, so... But anyway, next door to us lived the brewmaster, we had a local brewery. So one day, my dad gave him some fish, and he was German, come from Germany, see. So my dad talked to him, he could talk German, and then... Uh, he came over one day in the summer, he says, uh, my daddy, one of your boys would like to uh, it, help work, and you know, in summertime in the bottling, well, hell, the job's a job. So I took her, I got in there in the brewery, I worked, <laughs> and I worked, and then one guy quit and I got a steady job, that's where I got drafted, uh, see. Oh, really? So then I, uh, I uh, worked there, and then I had, a, uh, you know, I was going to the Army uh, June the 9th and had a big celebration, the brewery gave me beer and I had a party. Next morning I woke up and the doorbell rang. Here's a guy from the Western Union with a telegram from my brother. My brother got killed in action. Oh. And I was leaving the next day, so my uncle run the lumber yard business and uh, he uh, says, well, go up to the draft board. They should give you a week extension. Hell, you know, it's a critical time. And he was a captain in World War I. So I went up there, a guy named Gartsky. i never forget that name. And I told him, he said, what are you trying to do, get out of the army? Just them words. Jeez, that made me mad, you know. And I, so I went home and never said nothing. The next morning I left with 120, got down to Madison Fort shirt and sworn in there to interview, you know. And so I told this lieutenant uh, what happened. He said, just a minute, he went in, he got the, the head guy, I think it was a, a lieutenant colonel with the Eagle now, you know. And uh, he sat down and talked. He says, uh, would you like to go home? I said, no. I said, it's best to go on through. Well, he says, you know, he says, I, I never knew there was men like that in this country. So I went on through and uh, went through basic training at Fort Eustis, Virginia, you know. And uh, the 23rd of August, I didn't know, you know. Here come the general's car down to headquarters. They called my name in the general. <laughs> I went into the order room there, you know, and he says, are you Private Zuski? Yes, sir. He says, well, you get in that uh, staff car. My driver will take you right to the deep. You're going home. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, he says, they're having the uh, memorial service for your brother. He says, I don't know, but he says, you must know some high-powered people. <laughs> so I find out, I guess, uh, uh, see, my, mo my mother got a special letter from President Roosevelt. See, in 42, you know, they had just started the war. There was no action rally. And see, my brother was the first one that associated with the Flying Tigers. You know, that's a pretty famed outfit. So, uh, yeah, and then, so I got home, all right. And then when I went back, every, everybody was gone but me. 
Come to find out, I was supposed to go to Fort Sheridan, orders to go to Fort Sheridan. Illinois with the right home, you know? No, so I waited a week or two, and then they uh, sent me down to Texas and uh, went to 433rd was the outfit, AAA. And from there I went to Baytown, Texas, a little town out of Houston. They got there and they signed me to number one gun. There they were protecting these oil fields, oil refineries. Got out there, they had live ammunition and everything in them guns. So they said, well, they figured the German a submarine was going to launch a plane and bomb the... So that's, we was there until uh, December, and then we got on the train headed for New York. And then the rest is in that, you know, we shipped overseas, went so, to Casablanca. So even, I, you know, I knew here that we had, but I didn't, I forgot about Texas and the oil field. So even down there. Yeah. But down there, there were fear, fear of the Germans coming in. Yeah, they were fear, uh, they'd launch a plane from a sub and, uh, and just bomb that refinery. Yeah, we had live. We had a lot of firing done. We fired on a lot. Of, go out and you know, with the sleeve, a cub plane would pull a sleeve and shoot at it. And yeah, and the machine gun. I fired machine gun, a lot. Yeah. Now, yeah. having lost your brother prior to going over, yeah. did that change your mind of kind of the fear of going? Because that would really bring. <laughs> Things home. Yeah, no, no. Well, my dad lost a couple of brothers in World War One, so he had it. So, yeah. So uh, our name was well. Then after that, the American Legion took my brother's name, and a little airfield in town took his name too. So he's you know be there forever. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah. So now you. It's interesting because you went to um, for for a lot of uh, uh, World War Two. Uh, non-knowledgeable people, I mean, that know yeah. a little bit about World War II, of course, they know Pearl Harbor, yeah, they yeah. know D-Day in Normandy, but now you went to some little different areas. You Now, yeah. did you start out in Tunisia, or where did... No, we, uh, Casablanca, we ducked. So then, there, they uh, just pulled in the harbor, well, I went on the uh, convoy, there was 12 troop ships, and, uh, and they had about 12, 14 destroyers, and one big heavy cruiser going to Africa. So we got there, just pulled in the harbor and the goddamn air raid sir. <laughs> you know, first one, Jesus, scared, you know, but no plane come. So then they got us off the, we marched 12 miles, that full field pack with that old GI overcoat and just up pouring rain outside of Casablanca in a, in a field and here he had a pitch popped in and there was that much water in the ground. So there they got orders and then we put up tents, what the hell are you going to do, you got to, and everything. Next morning they got up and around, you know, and everybody gets situated. And and then the third day, I guess they got all whole battalion. One thousand men went on guard to guard the where they had all these supplies. They had acres and acres of supplies, ammunition, food, you know, and gas. So, but I didn't go on guard. I had a I was on guard around our perimeter, you know, where they had our tents. See, they had four men each on one side guarding them. When we had live there. Arabs all around you had a, they'd steal you blind, you know. So did they, you did you um? Uh, I'm just gonna turn one thing down here real quick. Yeah. Did you uh, being from Wisconsin? Yeah. Did you have the faintest idea where Tunisia was? Oh yeah, I knew that, uh, Africa. I knew that was, but I, I not much, but see. But we stayed there at uh, Casablanca for about two weeks after we got our... See, then we, one day we got our guns, and then they put us on the docks. See, we, they had pillars built where you could set a 40 millimeter right in, you know, on a regular built outfit. Maybe you've seen them with pillars and then the platforms, see. So there we could see all these, these Arabs would go into their ships and unload, carrying off sugar. I guess they got three cents a day. And the Frenchmen, they own that, run that, see. Then poor a uh, Arabs, you know, they'd carry up bags of sugar and there'd be a, a little leak in something. They'd go down to the ground to lick that up and them damn guards and Frenchmen would just wail them with them clubs on their back. They wouldn't even get up. I ain't telling you it was something. Well, look, he was only there two weeks. Then we went to Iran. Same thing there. Set up our guns on, on the piers. And there we was there about two weeks. Then we moved on to Algiers. There, there we set up on, on the dome. We relieved the British, 25-pounders. And we was on the hillside, 
and off to our left was a big Catholic cathedral with a gold dome. So we talked to the, the British soldiers, you know, they was above us, some of them, and they said, they'll come, you watch. There'll be a three-quarters full moon, and they'll come right over the top of here, he said, and you'll hear them bombs are whistling. Sure enough, here come that first night. You know, the planes could hear them coming. Two, three hundred, the, a big raid. Two hours and 45 minutes that last. They hit that dome, and then them bombs were just a whistling. <laughs> you know, just scared her in hell. Well, uh, the Navy, the British Navy had pulled in there, some ships, see, so they had all their guns on them shooting. And them smoke pots in town, all smoke coming up, and holy God, it was something, you know, just the first time. Scared, everybody was just scared. You know, it wasn't the German planes were bad, it was all them guys shooting down below it up. They just, yeah, and them bullets with 20 mil, just a singing over you, just like a hailstorm. That many bullets went over us. The next night, the same thing. <laughs> then he quieted down for a while. Yeah, see, then after a while, the war ended in uh, Tunisia. And then we then we moved up there, see. But we had uh, a couple men killed in Algiers. They were on that pier, and the bombs hit in the water, and a couple men killed. You know, they never even gave us a battle star for Africa. I don't have the Africa, yet we lost men. This wasn't right, I don't think, even though we wasn't near the front, you know. We didn't get there. We didn't get up there till later on, you know. See, and that's what's what's yeah. interesting as I as I start to say because the history books yeah. focus on the big name yeah, yeah, yeah. battles. Yeah, yeah. But there are places like yeah. Algiers, and, yeah. And, and 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 so we look and we say, okay, what was going on here, and why was it going on here? Yeah. yeah. You know what was yeah. what was the role of your Division being there in Algiers. Well, just to uh, protect the town, I guess. We had American troops there, a lot of them, you know, and they had the big airfield out there. Oh, by the way, when we left Algiers, they had Tunisia on the way there. I don't know how, or I can't know, is that, but the big U.S. airfield, and they were t the bombers were taken off. See, and here come one bomber off and got about a thousand feet and just exploded right in front of us. We could see in the, I'll say maybe eight, nine miles, you know, you could see. So when we got there, they all over the road, and that was just pieces of metal and just blown to hell everything on that plane. Just exploded in midair. It must have been a B-17 or B-24, I don't know whatever. But we drove right by, you know, you don't stop. So was Algiers, was that a, a, a kind of a staging? No, that was a big port, see. And uh, the British Navy would come in there and, and refuel and, and out there. Well, it was... Well, Iran, uh, yeah, Algiers was the uh, next stop was uh, Tunisia, see? So they they pulled a, put a lot of stuff in there. We loaded a lot of stuff at Algiers, yeah. They had all, we had a lot of guns around there, you know, because the Germans had a lot of airplanes, you know. Yeah, it surprised you how many they had. So did they, but when you were unloading, I mean, is that, so then from there was, that was a good place to land and then deploy stuff from there? Yeah, or? yeah. They had initial landing. They landed at Casablanca, Oran, Algiers. The initial landing in November 7th. See, and then they spread out from there. Yeah, see. Huh. So they, uh, that was three different points. Because they didn't know what was going to happen, I guess, because of kind of the French. And, and you know, they might not have uh, fought, but they didn't. Yeah. And them Arabs, God, you got to have a, uh, you know, they, we used to go and pass in Algiers sometime. Five men had to go downtown together. We had loaded rifles. Even on... on Just ordinary pass, maybe one hour. They let you, not very long. Just to go look her over a little bit. Man, there was some gut there. You know, the Casbar and some alleys in there. All them guys got them damn knives. And <laughs> it's something different. But they, ate some, they had good olives there, i say that. They have a big barrel, you know, and real good, you know. They had a lot of olives there and the apricots and, and that stuff. See, that's the interesting, to me, one of the interesting parts of war. Here's yeah. this war going yeah. on, bombers coming in and all yeah. that, and then you get a pass to, come yeah. as a tourist, yeah. go yeah. see another country. Yeah, and while we was at Algiers there, there was a, a French lady would come early in the morning, and they would go on this mountainside and just pick them dandelion uh, leaves to eat for salad. So we had a lot of... Uh, you know, extra we'd get that damn old spinach. I don't know what we had. Anyway, we, another thing, we were on British rations here. 
You know, they eat mutton four times a week and rabbit or not the other one. God damn it. We could smell that. You know, we'd have to go down and truck to the vessel. And you get near it, you could smell that mutton. Days of that. Well, anyway, we gave her a lot we had left over. And then finally we were going to leave. So she says, I'd like to invite uh, five, six of you boys over for a meal. Thank you. Have a little wine. We went over there, five, six of us. And uh, she had this big silver platter, you know. She brought out, set on the table there. Well, took that off, and here was a fish, big long fish, head and guts and all right in, you know. <laughs> she took a knife and just cut and gave each one a piece of that. Man, that, you know, she really meant good, you know, but God damn it. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do? Just pick, I picked the meat off, you know, and ate some of it, but yeah, there not much appetite there after you see that, you know. Yeah, yeah, but she meant good, yeah, poor lady, you know. God, that civilians, I felt so, they did, you know. And them Arabs, they would do anything to get even just, uh, they'd pick up every damn butt of cigarettes they threw. See, I never smoked, see. I kept my cigarettes. Another, I was going to say, you know, when we got on that, we, I got on a limey boat, English boat, you know, going to Africa. Well, Athlon Castle was the name of it, I remember that, you know. And uh, they had a little PX on there, but... Uh, they wouldn't sell you candy. You had to buy a whole box of candy bars. See, so a bunch of, you know, God, that child they had there, all they had was uh, Australian rabbit and mutton every day. Yeah, how in the hell are you going to live? Now we bought them old candy bars. Twelve days it took to get to Africa. Yeah, that's a, quite a, a that boat. You know, the first trip over, everything's new, and take a shower in salt water, and oh, man, everybody's sick, half of them. And then we hit a big typhoon just off of Africa coast. You know, everything's dark. And we had a man and an aircraft gun on that ship. You know what it was? An old World War I Marlin machine gun. 30 caliber. What the hell is that going to knock down, huh? That's what they had on there. Just imagine, yeah? God, six. And we, but it got so rough, they pulled us all off of the top part and then all at once the lights went on to that boat and that and the big way got that big old uh, tanker that crossed right in front of we just missed that thing by a few hundred yards if we'd have hit that tanker loaded with gas i guess that would have been something huh yeah yeah that would have been but you know you, hell everything is dark you you oh god you get caught uh court martial if you light a cigarette or any go outside with us you know it was they were strict you know they had to be you know, because a uh, yeah, cigarette, you know. So when when you, uh, once you got over there and got onto land, you were living in tents all the time? Pup and... tent, yeah. Or, yeah. or pup tent, yeah, for oh. quite a while. One, two? Two, two to a tent. Two to a tent? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. That... And then constantly on the move? you here for a while and then? Load up and go. But after we got up uh, into... Uh, Tunisia, there, there we met the British Army. You know, we talked. I talked to some of them guys that had been on the desert five, six years. Man, there was a hard bunch. You know, I traded, uh, you know, them uh, gumdrops or what, you know, like uh, raspberry and lemon and all them. And I had a box of them. So I traded to this me for a quart of beer. You know, you know what he done with that? He t got it, wrapped it up, and sent it home to his wife and kids. She, they had never had them. God, he said, my wife. He said, I'll bet you she was so glad to get that, yeah. He, he sent it home, man. Yeah, he got a quart of beer. See, they get a quart of beer a week. We didn't get nothing until I was way, but we had the old sour wine, you know, got there. You know, you could be out in the big field. We was off out of the, way in the field, just a dust, and oh, man, just de a foot deep. Here's some old Arab come with a big old rack on his back carrying about 25 bottles of wine selling it. Sour, drink that sour wine till you couldn't drink it no more. Yeah, yeah so you even, you you know, hear the troops are yeah. going along, and yet there's still kind of this average day aspect of, yeah. of oh, yeah. one of the Arabs coming to yeah. you and bartering and oh, selling. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, all the time, yeah. Huh. He bartered all, all the way through the war. Like trade, uh, you know, well, after we got into Sicily, it's a little more better. See, there we, we landed at Palermo, and then we... Uh, Went down to Gila, and there we uh, sat around this P-51 base. You know, all our, about they had about 200 uh, P-51s there. 
And every morning at sunrise would take off about 50 of them. And then in the evening towards sunset, another 50 would take off. Wow. See, they'd go head towards Italy and then they'd come back and circle and land. And we guarded that field and for a while. But there we had uh, these old Italian, you know, sit, come around there. Hell, we'd give them some cigarettes. They'd bring us, guy would come with a whole platter full of spaghetti <laughs> on his bicycle. Out, you know, yeah, he'd bring it out to us. So then we... Uh, Guy come around and had chickens, so we had trade chickens. We had uh, about 15, 20 chickens around our gun. So one day we decided, well, we better kill the chickens and eat them. We did, but no goddamn frying pan. Gee. Well, guy said, well, let's, we had plenty of that five gallon round gas can. So we got emptied that out, and the guy chiseled her down about that high, and he boiled it with water, and I put everything else we had in there, salt, and that goddamn gas smell never did leave. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, so my God, we yeah, yeah, had a quite a time. We finally got her. We ate her up, though, man. Yeah, but in Sicily, you had to be uh, careful because they had a lot of orange trees. But the Germans booby trapped them. You, you pick an orange and go off and blow your fingers off. So we had a guy that was, uh, you know, just no hell. He said we'll fix that. He went and got an old big long pole and he had something on there. And, he just reached, if it did go, he'd, but we never did hit none, see, you know, but uh, but that, you know, you get all the, oh, then when we got in Africa, way up there to Tunisia too, you know, heard the stories about this American soldier that got there, and he seen a Luger laying on the ground. Well, you know, you're, you're told about booby traps and that, so he thought to himself, well, that, uh, he better not pick that up, he, so he tied, got a string around it, and and then he went back, and there was a foxhole over there. He jumped in the foxhole, see? But the hell of it was the booby trap was in the foxhole. It wasn't in the gun. <laughs> Got him. So they told us them story. You know, you hear that. You know, that nobody else hears unless you're there that, you know, about that. Oh, yeah, they booby trapped quite a bit. We was awful. Uh, buildings and care if you had to be. Well, then, but we got into Sicily around that P-51 field, and... Uh, we had a sandbag around our gun. So we going down to the beach and to get some sand because that ground over there was so hard and dry, you held a pick, you know, you just get a chunk like that. And when you've got a thousand sandbags to fill the hole around them guns, you know, that's a hell. So they said the engineers was cleared. So I got on the truck with about five, six other guys. We headed down to the beach and damn, we drove in there and boom. Here with the whole goddamn engine up in here, hit a mine. Right. You know, we got off of that truck and walked out there and never got... The engineers come down, they had their minesweeper there, detectors. If we'd have went from here to there, the back wheel would have been over another mine and we'd all been gone. That would <laughs> raise your sweat, huh? That's how close it was. Yeah. But the goddamn engineer said that was all clear. See, they're supposed to clear them mines. But it sure wasn't there. I'll never forget that mess. But... It's mere, the guy in the front seat got banged up a little bit, but not too bad, you know. It didn't kill nobody, but still, Jesus, that's an awful explosion. The mind, but that's one of the things that happened there. I know for sure that, yeah. So it sounds like you faced a lot of the, uh, even though you weren't yeah. up no. face to face all the time, you still, I mean, the, yeah. the kind of dirty pool. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. So then we then we got, you know, we took uh, Sicily, then we went to Messina. And we stayed there all night, and we went on a boat and crossed over the Straits, and then went to southern Italy and, and drove to Naples. Nine days it took. Up them old little old road, and we pulling our guns, come through a curve. Five, six times you had to back up to get around that curve. One day I think we made eight miles, you know, going up. Man, it just then you'd meet these old donkeys, these old Italians would come with their little donkey cart and the bridge or something, and hell, he couldn't back up. Oh, God. It, it was laughable. He had to laugh at some of them, you know. Who was it? Uh, Patton, I think, in, was it Patton or somebody? There was one bridge that the army was moving in, and one of them come along, and he pushed the whole damn thing over. The donkey and wagon, he says, he can't hold us up. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like Patton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was he was a commander in Sicily. You know, and we heard about that soldier being slapped too. You know, we, before there was, you know, you, rumors fly around pretty fast there in the service. You know, we heard about that. Yeah. Well, anyway, we got there to the scene, and then we drove to Naples. We got there. We stayed in uh, 
Mussolini University in the basement. Was there the first night and just got in there and figured I'd just leave her to the air raid sirens go off. And man, did they pulverize that city. They had big 90s going off and man, they millimeters and just a, Jesus, man. I was glad we got orders in about a week here and then we went casino. We heard a lot about that already, you know, because the rumors were that it was a tough place up there. So we got there, we leave the 36th Division gunners. They were, but we had to drive way up a mountain side. But we we got up there and we could see that Abbey easy. You know, it was about 10 miles away in that and see. But they were going to assault it, uh, you know, try to cross. Well, next two or three days, oh man, that sky was just red down there. You know, they tried to cross and Germans kicked them back. Heavy casualties, 36 come back, just all, you know, they all, I don't know, did you hear that rumor? They went into a court martial Mark Clark for that, that Texas division. See, that was all 36th in Oklahoma. Yeah, they, they, was, they figured they was wrong because he didn't have enough to get across there. Hell no, they just slaughtered him. Yeah, so anyway, but in the meantime, there's one uh, who is on the mountain, and this old German strafer coming along Highway 8 that run down below us to the, you know, and... Man, oh man, all them 50 calibers on the ground opened up <laughs> right at us again. Man, I hit the ground flat and laid there, and them damn shells just going through them old trees and clipping everything. 50s, you know, man, when you got about uh, two, 300 guns firing down below, everybody fires. Man, oh man. But we didn't stay there long, 30 days old. Then we, we pulled back and we went to Anzio. There was the famous spot. We come in a week later, right on, I, we, right on my birthday, the 29th of January, we went in there and we pulled in, and uh, a Corporal Platt said to him, hey, Zuski, go down each other, it was quarter to 12. Well, I got down halfway to the galley, and a damn big shell hit right aside that ship. And went down there, and man, the sieve holds guys in there, bunk had their heels, uh, sh big shrapnel, Man, we had 33 casualties on one shell. The guy that relieved me was dead. Corporal Platt got her right there. If I'd have been there another five minutes, I'd have been gone. That's fate. And that uh, was a, one of the, the, the big shells fired off of a... Big artillery gun. Yeah. You don't mind it. When it was a good, but you think that guy would move that boat? That LST? We stayed right there. At 4 o'clock, we went into the beach. We got off of there, you know. And then it got dark, and they run us into a place, and everybody digging in the airplanes and bombing all over us. Holy man. Come the way out, here he was in the ammo dump, and that thing was blowing and exploding. <laughs> Daring it all. We got out of there, got enough out of that ammo dump during the day, just off the side until that night. Then they took us into a rig there with that 60. There we hooked up with the 69th Armored Field protecting them. That, then we got there, we dug our holes in, and there's where we stayed four months till the 23rd of May. Right? So that, this is your, you, you're in a foxhole now. Yeah, yeah. We had him down there. I slept with Adam Bragg. Well, you use a dog leg, you know, you dig in this way and then your foxhole is that way. Because if the shell hits here, it won't go in the, see. see. But I, we dug in deep and then we had limbs we put over us, crossways this way, and then six stacks of sandbags on top. <laughs> that still, when that big shells hit around you, they still shake, shudder, you know, just like that earthquake. <laughs> yeah. So but, how, how much, when you're in it, uh, in the foxhole, yeah. is it, I mean, is it just like, if I just dug a hole big enough for me to fit in, or do you have no, a little... No, we had a little room. You make a digger, you you know, because we took a couple of days to dig her good, yeah, and got her, and just decided, some of them were bigger than the other ones, the ones that were lazy, they had the smaller one, the guys, but anyway, it was up to you. But anyway, we was there, and off to our right, oh, I'd say about a half a mile, was a forest. And found out later the guys that hauled the ammunition and some other units that was in there anyway. And them Germans shelled that goddamn area. They drove everybody out of there, but them uh, ammo haulers, they stuck with it. Them, you should have seen when that forest took a, I would like to have a camera, because we didn't, wasn't authorized any, couldn't have none. And uh, to see it to start, and then when we moved out of nothing but just blown the woods, we just blown the hill. I don't know how in the hell them guys took her, but they were had big foxholes and 
And then we had to dig our trucks in on, below the tire line because they were destroying and didn't have the stuff to get in there. You know, They only gave us two cans of sea rations a day for about 30 days. And then we had five gallons of water for uh, 18 men a day. That's all we got, fresh water. So when you started, I'm going to back up just yeah. a When you started, you're in New Foxville, you look off to your right, and there's a forest. Yeah. Trees. Yeah, half a mile about. When you got done. Yeah, it, it was all like a tornado hitter. You know, it just teared everything up. That shrapnel just blew all them trees to hell. Yeah, it's just a no man's land. That's what it was. All that and so, you know. It got so desperate there, heck. And then things got really desperate there, heck. You know, they come around in our guns later on and took two men off each gun. You have to go up to an area there, and there you would carry mines for the engineers to lay in no man's land. See, the guys went up there. And then, then uh, when, well, you heard about Darby's Rangers, didn't you? You ever hear of them? They was off to uh, town a little bit away. There they all got trapped, you know, and they got wiped out. Six of them only survived that out of a thousand men. But the third division, the guns we had there, they fired 1,200 rounds per gun that night to try to break through. Never could get through. And, the, and uh, it rained and rained so hard and mud. We had to carry ammunition for them guys. You know, that weighs 92 pounds, a box of them, uh, uh, 105 shells, carrying them through mud till here. Jesus Christ, that's work. Huh? But, yeah, yeah. And then on the 23rd of March, a uh, lieutenant come around about noon. He says, uh, okay, everybody go out. He said, here, you dig your hole here, you here, here, here. Take your rifle, all the ammunition you got, you're going to be infantry. Because I think the Germans are coming. He said, they rumors, see. So about noon on the... 23rd of March, the Germans opened up with a hell of a rogers, you know, and then, man, the shooting, you know, we wasn't too far from the front. <laughs> and, man, and then it, all about 1 o'clock, he just started to pour rain. And, man, we sat in them damn foxhole and right in that hole I did there from 6 until midnight. Never moved an inch, and these are just staring out there, you know, seeing nothing. And by God, the next day she was all quiet. They, we heard rumors later they got bogged down in the mud and couldn't move. Otherwise, we might have all been prisoners because there was rumors that we were going to get her. They, they would have got her, I think, too, because there was nobody left in the front. Because we had a, a guy that was uh, his brother come to visit him at our gun, and he was in the infantry up there. And he said they were uh, short of men then. He said we didn't have no manpower at all left. It was... Man, that was terrible. That was an awful tight. Awful. And air raids, 53 air raids a day there. Wow. Imagine. And then that night, every night old bed check Charlie would come. You know, that's one plane just dropping anti-personnel bombs one night. You know, drop a big bomb and then they'd fling around throughout all little ones. And next night, the big high explosive bombs and just all, you could just hear them over. Just like an old washing machine engine that plane had sounded, see. And that's would go, and we. Uh, but they had our anti-aircraft. They had it in mile squares. And ours was pointed. Well, we was in, I think, D or ninety-one or ninety. I know it's in the ninety. And uh, we had our gun pointed at a certain elevation. And then the phones we had on, they would say the plane is at ninety-two, going towards ninety-one. And then all the ones we'd get the order to fire, you know. And we had it on automatic, and then we'd just fire as fast as maybe 20 rounds each gun. But I got one night we shot down eight single planes that way. Whoever designed that, he knew what he was doing. Eight single, but 50 minutes later, another one. Bed check Charlie was there. And then we could hear every night or so, Anzio Annie, that big railroad gun, you heard of that one? That 150-foot barrel job? It's on three flat cars. They could move it. And yeah, but I we went up uh, after we broke out of here. I went. We drove up the one by Chisavicha. We pulled in there and looked at. We all looked at that big gun, but that shell would go over to us towards the harbor. See, you know, just like that would howl. Then all man, 
Then we heard later, you know, they, because they couldn't get them freighters into the beach, see, so they had to use these ducks, you know, army duck. Boy, they must have took a pounding, I think. Uh, yeah, I heard because I heard the, uh, through the uh, on the aircraft guys there that guns along the beach they would get direct hits and wipe out the whole crew. You know, big shell would hit her. Yeah. They, and that's what they they were trying to destroy the beach where you were yeah. in between, right? Yeah, yeah. Beach them. Yeah. And, well, you know how big that beachhead was, on Anzio? Four miles in, ten miles long. Wow. And the Germans had us on all three sides. They sunk a big, heavy cruiser out there. You know, a, a British cruiser went down. They sunk that. Yeah. But uh, they just didn't quite have her to get us off of there. But when they first went into Anzio, they had, we had uh, scouts, uh, patrols in Rome. I don't know why Clark pulled back. Nobody knows. Yeah, on the History Channel, that's a big blunder, you, uh, if you noticed it. Yeah. I, I haven't. I yeah, mean. I watched that once. Well, it said some big blunders were over. That's one of them. <laughs> yeah, Casino was another one. They showed that. Now, is Casino's the one that had the uh, Abbey. Yeah, and and the, the whoever was calling stuff yeah. out from there, yeah. and they finally had to get in. Yeah. And, well, when after well, then we t we got our hands and we went up to Ro uh, Rome and took Rome, and then north and there, and then we come back outside of Naples to get ready for southern France. So uh, they. Run the truck up the casino. I went long up, so we went up. To, we looked at. We got. You, you go straight road for about six miles, and then you turn left. The Rapido River's right in front. Cross the river, turn left, and then the mountain goes right up there. See, the Abbey is right up there. So this Continental Hotel is right with that road. The Germans backed the great big tiger right in that lobby of that hotel, and uh, put sandbags around it, and they had that barrel pointing right down that road for six straight miles. Uh, I, we heard that they hit a, a Red Cross jeep with two women in there, got blown to hell. And uh, but every eight or nine minutes, they'd fire around down that road. They never did get. Uh, well, that tank was still in there when we went to see. And right in front, along there, yeah, must have been twelve or fifteen graves. With I mean, I don't know if they were buried there, but they had a marker: Polish, French, American, British, Moroccans. Uh, uh, Gurkhas and uh, from India, all one nation, every one nationality that fought there, there was a cross with it. Uh, yeah, we looked all looked looked at that. It was because it finally took the Polish troops to the Polish volunteers. It finally did take Anzio. I mean the casino on top. Huh. That was a boy. They lost a lot of men there. Does it? You know, it movies have made war. This <laughs> this. They show the they, well. They show two things. Yeah. They show the heroics yeah, yeah. and they show the fear. Yeah. How far off are they from what war? I mean, did, did it become a job for you, or or were you scared spitless all the time? Or? But what the hell can you do? You can't. Uh, you sure you're scared of artillery, but I think you, after longer you're there, you get too brave, because you could tell the minute that late '88, you know the big stuff. You take a shell, that, uh, you could hear the boom, and then you could hear the shell go. But at 88, you can't, because it's high velocity. It's too fast. See? And that just, boy, that just got an old screeching sound to it, boy. The minute you hear that, you hit the dirt. And then also, them Germans had them radioactive shells, you know, that would go off and they go over some iron. You heard of them shells, you know. We had them too, but, you know, <laughs> they had every, you know. Bad, but uh, well, what the hell are you gonna do? You gotta go. And another thing, when you when we broke out of Anzio, there we we come to this uh, crossing in the road. Here was a combat MP directing traffic. Fox roll right there, and you hear a shell coming in, getting in there, and then he'd halt all the traffic. And then when he got out of there, he'd boast here those guys would race them trucks to get through there. We would get on the other side. And he, Man, I wouldn't want his job there for a while until they knocked them artillery out of the ridge. Yeah, it, it wasn't there. And anyway, when we broke out the ends, you know, the first little town we come to stopped, and and the guys, uh, old two guys, took five gallon cans looking for wine. See, so uh, the guy went up to this old uh, guy standing there, the MP in the corner. Hey, he says, "Hey, buddy, where's there some wine around here?" He says, "Well, you better not be around here long. There's a lot of snipers left here in town." What he said, most of them were coming in that house over there. Here was an old colonel from the MPs, combat colonel. 
They were all right, but they weren't uh, the guys. But, oh, here's, here's another story. I'll tell you, it's a good one. Well, we said Anzio there. Finally, uh, we put all our names or in the hat and uh, drew out a card. The highest card got to go back for two days. It was, you know, when things were more consolidated, you know, everything. So, all in, so they had a whole LST, all combat men off Anzio going back around Naples there to this rest area for two days or so, get new clothes and shower and everything. When they come back, they had stories. Three quarters of them got tossed in the jug. No necktie. See, they, you know. And uh, this one guy uh, said, this infantry sergeant, this old major from the MPs, guard, took guards and guarded them from the prison, you know where they had them, to the boat to get on there and go back to the front. The own men under guard pushing them on. The, he, this major, this old sergeant said the major, he said, we'll be back. Don't you remember? We were, well, anyway, you know, we took Rome and went north of Naples, and everybody come back to Naples, and all around Naples, all troop bivouac. Here come the word. We're going in tonight. Here the infantry were in grenades and into that town, and uh, all them uh, taverns and were all, see, all colored ones were the back guys. See, there wasn't many on the line. They had the women and all the goddamn clean house down there in Naples. Uh, why I know happened, because my brother's wife's brother was an MP in Naples. And I met him after the war. And he said, Butch, I was in on that. He said, by God, he said, they blew us up and, and, and we had lost a lot of men killed. He said, our MPs and uh, everything, he says. And I got, he volunteered for infantry and, infantry, and that's where he got hurt, uh, wounded. See, so he told me that was true. All, yeah, he says they run them colored guys out of there. Jesus Christ, it take nothing. Yeah, they got they relieved the whole that whole area commander over that. Wow. But that wasn't right, you know. They all they had was their old. They didn't have no necktie or anything there, and and went and law, off Lemons area to get some beer or wine. They, they, they were tough guys up on that front there, you know. Well, that's one of the stories that happened there. Huh. Well, anyway, then we got into southern France. That was wasn't bad invasion there. We got in there, and there we we it was right on the beach. We had our gun, and the LSTs would come in, you know, with all supplies and that. We grabbed them some rations, sugar, ham, buried underneath our ammunition in our trucks. God damn, we got word here the CID was going to come around, you know, and uh, God damn it. We got march order, go back up to the front. Good, we had everything packed. Went way up around Epinal there in the Vosges Mountains there, you know, and, and in the big old field again. We never got it, you know, always out in the field with that aircraft. You got to be out where you can shoot, you know. And there's mud and old people. We we took some sugar and flour down this German lady. I could talk a little German, you know, enough to get by. On it. She baked us some nice bread and, man, all cut it. And we had that ham, we had some potatoes, and you were off the field, and man, that was a meal. Yeah, we, it ain't all that bad sometimes. And we had cigarettes, I had cigarettes, you know, we could trade. We could trade cigarettes, you know, trade cigarettes for... Another thing in Italy, while we was waiting to go to the invasion, uh, we was in this bivouac area, and these uh, Italian women would come around, you know, and take your, wash your fatigues and start, you know. And they were muddy, and they would take all your fatigues and clothes, and, they would uh, wash them and press them just for a little piece of that soap. You know, it was like that Fels naphtha, that the GI soap we called it, but it's like Fels naphtha, you know. Just, they'd give a, the mess or the supply center would just give you a small piece. See, you'd, you, because they didn't want to waste it, you know, just enough to do your, and they would do your clothes just to forget what was left of that soap. And that was damn hard work scrubbing all them fatigues down in the river bottom. They didn't have no hot water. I don't think no Italians much. Because that was going to be one of my questions. I, yeah. You know, you're out packing through this mud yeah. and everything yeah. like this. You got your backpack on, yeah. and I and I know you didn't carry anything extra. Yeah. How long did you wear clothes out there before you could wash them or oh, change? I mean, you know how we uh, uh, cleaned our clothes in Anzio? You never would guess. We boiled them with gas. Then we hung them on the dry and put them back on. What are you going to do? You can't go no place. No place to go. Hell, you warm it. Some guys warm until you almost fell off. 
But these guys that went back, see, they all they went through a, a place where they uh, gave him a shower and just threw new clothes at him. Yeah, but hell, uh, you know, he never got back. But we, cause hell, we didn't have no water. Uh, five gallons there for quite a while. We got only a day. But after a while, we got a little more. And and uh, you know, you'd air your clothes out anyway. Just hang them, hang them over an old limb or something, you know, and lay them on the grass. And, uh, at least they got a little fresher than where. What are you gonna do? Christ, it was cold, wet. <laughs> I was gonna say, were you just wet all the time? No, 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 no. You got your cold, but you know that old GI overcoat. That when that got wet, that stayed wet for about a week. <laughs> yeah, you know. But we had a lot of blankets. See, you pick up extra blank. You know, we didn't have no sleeping bags or anything. You know, we had I I had leggings until. Uh, we got north of Rome, then they, I got a pair of com first combat boots. Huh. See, yeah. Then they gave us overshoes that first winter. I kept my overshoes, and some guys threw them away, but I kept them. We got in France there, and the, you know, during the Battle of the Bulge, we were south of that. So I'm glad I kept my, it was 23 below. Yeah, that would see. And that, well, anyway, we got into France, and we pushed up through there, and then we uh, got into, we got into one town, I think, Sargerbin was the name of it. There, the, uh, over the Sar River, the big bridge. So they put us in a field, guarding that bridge. And by God, one night we were sitting on our gun there and we heard explosions going off. Well, God damn it, what the hell is that? And we kept going pretty soon off to our right. Whoom! God damn it, knocked a couple of the guys down. And the, Jesus Christ. Went over there and looked at that hole. You could drive a deuce and a half in there. A great big gun, but the ground was froze, and they were firing delayed action shells that went in the ground. See, and then that back would come and just blew all dirt over us. Whole gun, just a bunch of jays. Every twenty minutes we'd hear one come. But I got a little while later. Next one was over that way from us. Same thing, just dirt all over us again. And then off to our left, whoever picked that gun spot must have had the Lord on his side because, man, if we'd have been either way, we'd have been a goner. Yeah, we, Captain come out the next day and he just shook his head. He looked at that. So he, he moved us to another field where we wasn't in line to that, you know, where he still could do the job but not. <laughs> man, oh, man, that was close. I'll tell you, yeah, three times we this covered us up with Dirt, but them, you could drive a hole, a deuce and a half in one of them ex holes. Big, you know, frozen dirt, you know, and some chunks heck bigger than that, you know. Right, almighty. Now, it, it's interesting because, again, you talk about going into all these towns yep. and stuff. Yep. And the, the movies, yep. they what they would show us, some guy, yep. you know, running this way through the town. Was it like that, or were, the, were some of these towns... Still operational and businesses were still open. Or oh what? yeah. Well, when they first take a town, they uh, uh, martial law. U.S. puts martial law on it. See that everything no lights at night. They, MPs patrols go around all through the night, and if there's a light on, they don't ask questions. Just brrr, shoot the light out with the machine gun. Well, the, them French and German, they know just well. They they obey them pretty. They got to until they get far enough ahead, and then. Uh, they go right, but they start right while we was there all around the heck. We stayed in this uh, French house there in this one where I was talking about that shells, and we slept in her house. She gave us rooms in the place where we'd all just lay on the floor. Hell, it's better than out in the cold. And she'd walk to the next town, which was 12 miles away, to get a loaf of bread and a piece of meat. That's how desperate they were. But we always had, you know, they, them, we'd go to the mess hall and eat, and we had a little stuff like that old corned beef and hash and goddamn stuff like that, I'll say, and uh, spam and all that. And we always had some, so we'd give her something. And there was a lot of these big jackrabbits around there in them open fields. Yeah, damn it, them guys would shoot at them with them rifles, and by God, finally one guy got one of them great big, and that lady fixed that up, and man, that tasted good. Yeah, but yeah, she'd walk there and and give us some stuff. But uh, you know, well, I'd we'd walk, I'd trade stuff. You know, in them little towns, you get a uh, little house, you go there and ask them if they got any uh, eggs and that show. If they had two, you get two, three eggs for a pack of cigarettes and soap and 
you know, they'd give it, you know. Cause well, were, were the businesses just shut down, though? I mean, I think of here yesterday, we had this big earthquake, yeah, yeah. and about a half an hour everybody was freaked out, and then, boom, everything's back to normal again. Yeah. Were stores just shut down and, and vacant? or Yeah, just until the troops all went through it, the town, you know, say two, three, some town, you know, they, they never shut down because, hell, the army just rolled right through. They never even, no battle was fought there. Now, like, Charmes, France, now that one, the French or the Americans took that town and the Germans recaptured it and just destroyed the hell out of it. Everything they blew up. Yeah, when they kept back, you know, they were mean. Yeah. But anyway, uh, they, so then we sat on the, uh, Oppenheim is where they crossed the Rhine River, see, and we had a position right up on top. And then we guarded that, uh, you know. It took them eight hours to put three bridges across. Wow. The engineers, you know, the pond, uh, and them engineers got shelled and, and uh, the planes, we didn't have, they didn't have too much left there. But there's where we seen the first uh, German jet, M262. You heard of that? Yeah, that's the one that uh, flew by us and we fired and got there six, eight miles behind him. Yeah. Did you have the faintest idea what it was? No, but we knew it was an awful fast airplane. Yeah, he said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm, yeah we, so it was, oh. But you get along with the civilians, you know, they're, most of them are pretty good here. Yeah, yeah, they, but uh, they captured it. It was in some tight spot. And well, I was in on that Colmar pocket, you know, the, the pincher, the Germans tried to pinch us around, see? And there was just two miles separating their pinches, and along this highway, we had all artillery, hub to hub, hey, just firing. But the Germans never made it, and we circled them. We kept, they must have captured about 500 truckloads of prisoners there because they kept going and going by a gun all, just all day long, just prisoners. The guy with the MPs, they would load the prisoners up, and then he'd hand one his rifle, and then he'd get up there and hand it back. Yeah, yeah. They were so glad it was over with, too, I guess, you know. We, we were a little, for the most part, a little more... Yeah. Civil to our prisoners. Than yeah, yeah, some yeah, of the other. yeah. I had my uh, my cousin was prisoner. He was shot down his first air raid over Berlin, and he was prisoner fourteen months. And he'd, he'd tell me a lot what they they didn't have nothing to eat. He said they ate them cow beets and everybody. They didn't have much neither. I don't think. Was it just chaos? I mean, did you know where you were going, when you were going, or are you just one foot in front of the other? And no, no, we do. You know where we was going? Yeah. But see, we didn't have to walk. We had two trucks. One pulled the gun, the other one pulled that quad triplet 50 caliber machine gun. So we was always on the truck. You know, if it rained, we'd sleep under the truck or in the truck or, you know, uh, when we were moving. The only bad thing was every time we stopped, you're supposed to dig that goddamn gun in. You know, that's a pretty big gun, that 40 millimeter after a while. Some of that ground is pretty tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, uh, it was... It wasn't all picnic. So I was going to say, did you dig it less and less every time? It's like, oh, I've dug it in before, or are you still... We got into a wheat field north of Rome, and all, you know, they had the wheat uh, the field stacked up. You know how they stack up wheat, so we put them around the gun, you know, and the captain come around, he said, man, you guys better dig in. Hell, he didn't even... We were just getting our shells ready. He didn't get the half a mile away from our gun and march order come. That means to move on. We're going to move already. Sometimes you move six, seven times one day. Yeah. So, God. We said, uh, then uh, we said, while we was there, here come this 70th Division, right from the States. Come over, brand new outfit, you know. Man, oh man, them guys, they just couldn't wait. They were all eager. Here, we've been over there 30 months, see. You know, and uh, they was just raring to go, you know, and couldn't even uh, wait to get them first rounds off. And the guy said, how is it over here? Oh, well, you find out. You get your dose. Sure enough, they fired it. And finally, gave, old Heine gave them a little dose and sent a few of them back at him. You know, they shook him up a while. You know. Well, anyway, we moved in this area, and right over the town, Right over a hill, there was a German, Germans held out there in this town. So we were just on this side of the hill, you know. And man, morning come, here come about 50 
P-47 just coming right over the top of us and tipping their wings and waving at us and just dive bombing in that town machine gun and it, one right after another. That wave was gone another bunch. And then the big guns opened up and uh, then over the hill they went tanks and all that, you know. You know. But <laughs> in one place, this uh, division commander had seven, this division come up to our gun and we had a big fire, open fire, and everybody was around there. He said, come up, guys, you better put that fire out. <laughs> Why? God, the Germans are just over the hill here. Oh, hell, it ain't going to hurt us anyway. Said, How long you guys been over here? Oh, two and a half years. Well, I guess you know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they had a lot of little comic stuff, too, you know. But, yeah. It, but then we got, uh, when the war ended there, then we guarded this big sugar warehouse in Valmarad. They had just all 100-pound bags of sugar in there. And they had three of us guards on there. And the war was over, see, but the, we took that to keep the Germans from looting it all, and they put guards like elevators, I mean, not uh, grain elevator, you know, where, where the grain was ground, and other places important, and just so they wouldn't. But anyway, this sugar deal, I used to take some of them 100-pound sacks at night and, Take him around his old tavern there, and so the guy gets some beer and that and all the stuff to eat. And then, yeah, then I'd have to go with the truck. Every day I'd go around to the breweries to pick up beer. See, then at noon we opened up the gas, the tavern for the troops in the afternoons. See, beer and wine. We had wine. Hell, we got in. We had a barrel of wine on our truck. We had, oh God, yes. Yeah. We we had a kitchen stove on that truck. We put in our tent to it. Yeah, yeah. We did a truck around right them houses. It, oh, a guy said just, you could write, have a movie of all that would be something, just the way, that, or some of the things that happened like that, you know? And so that was after the war ended. Yeah. All of a sudden. No, no, this was during the war. Oh, yeah. during but the war. Once we got into Germany there, yeah, we just took what we could from them too. We knew, you know, they took everything from us, so we just got a little bit. So then we knew we'd come to them Germans' houses. We knew, I knew that up in their chimney, they got a, a compartment up in there where they kept their ham and bacon, you know, that stuff. You, so we got into that, too. We got some, found some, but not too much. You know, <laughs> heck, yeah. You yeah, know, it was, it was something. But anyway, after the war, we had a, we had a very good captain. He was a nice captain, yeah. Yeah, because he, he would, uh, we opened, we didn't train much after the war, you know, just that, well, right after that, we was on all these roadblocks. They had road checkpoints, and there they would check all that. All this, just hundreds of thousands of people just going looting around. They didn't know where to go in Germany, you know. And uh, at night time comes, and if they knock at your door, and you got just a, one little room that they can lay on the floor, if you turn them away, you're go to prison, because you know they everything was bombed in. But Jays or some just pushing old buggies and. Anything that they could move, it was just a shame. Nothing to eat. I don't know how in the hell they ever made it. I, I wonder. But we would check them, you know. By God, some of them, we caught some of them trying to get around them damn checkpoints. You know, they were Nazis, and, and we captured a few of them. I imagine that. And there must have been hundreds and hundreds of them uh, checkpoints in Germany then, because all the troops were doing the same thing. See, they were after a lot of people, I guess. You know. So you were, at that point, you were... Uh for housing and stuff as you moved into a village? Yeah, we yeah we slept in a school. Oh, really? Yeah, big school. So we was all inside and, you know, on, on the floors you slept, but you had your sleeping bag. At least you're out of the rain and all that, see. And then then we pulled guard at some of them certain places. Well, there was no guard. Two, three guys would go there and just, no, the Germans never bothered, never had one incident of them trying to, uh, you know, get anything. Did, did, did you get the feeling... I mean, was it like one day you were in war and the next day it was out of war and you were just more worried about getting things wrapped up and getting home? Or Oh, yeah, you could, but hell, you couldn't do that. They, everybody had to go to France. You know, all you heard about that point system, you know. So anyway, when the war was over, everybody was talking about that, see. One point for every month in the Army, one point for every month, five points for each battle star. Well, I had 100 points, so I didn't, 85 was a cutoff. And you know how many men in the United States Army had over 85 points out of uh, 485,000 out of 16 million? That's all. So we didn't have to go to the Pacific. So then uh, 
the war come, you know, and then, well, we was waiting, and, and they were taking divisions from Europe and sending them back to the States for 30 days, and then they would have to go to the Pacific. Well, 69th Division was won, and uh, then the war uh, come down that uh, they dropped the atomic bomb, see, and that the rumor spread, and then the peace signs come, you know, they were going to sign for peace. So by God, in uh, one day, they took all of us high point men and switched them into that 69th Division, and they went back, and we all got on, that's where we had old cattle cars, and we all headed for the Harve, you know, on that train. There was all high point men on there, and we got to the Harve, and that, they had Tent City, Camp Lucky Strike, 60,000 men living in tents up there, 60,000 on that big airfield. And then there's where we, uh, then we crossed the channel on the, on the Exchequer, and then we went to, uh, on the Queen, and got coming home. So the the um, yeah. tell me about getting in the train cars and all that. I mean, how did you know where you were going and who was getting in where? Or was it just what the, was that like? And what was the trip? Well, like? you got your company. You go with a certain. You go with in, all in there. What got in that train car? We go. We, we'd go for one hour. Stop. Pull on the side track. See the only. They didn't have all the rails were bombed and that. See they couldn't get through. So they pull us off the side track. Sit there for four day, uh, four hours, then move another two hours. It took us about seven days, but they had certain places along the way where we'd get to where they fed us. Well, wherever they stopped, the guys went in the woods and the hill. They, God, you couldn't go in that damn railroad car. <laughs> Some of them, right out the side door, they went down. <laughs> trying, the minute they stopped, they were trying to get wine, beer, and trade stuff, and God damn you, God damn anything. It was, it was wild. What was it? You had a, you, you, you called the train cars something. Uh, Forty and eights. Forty men or eight horses. <laughs> yeah, that was the day, yeah. So it was like a cattle car. I mean, it was an honest God cattle car. Yeah, yeah, with, with the whole horses in, see, because all shrubs, air, a lot of air ventilation, see. But heck, how are you going to, that was good to get there, you know, but no tracks. But anyway, when we crossed the Rhine, I went through uh, Frankfurt. Hey, man, oh man, you know, there was only one road through that town. And it, it was just rubble. Nuremberg, the same way I went through Nuremberg. I, we stayed overnight in the uh, big stadium where Hitler made all them speeches. There we stayed one night, then we moved on. Yeah. The war was just about over with then, you know, yeah. What was that like being there? Oh, it was all bomb too, and you know, and just, we got, the war wasn't over yet quite, but almost. Did you know what it was though? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cause I've got the, the, the newsreel of them saying, and he says, watch the swastika. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just, but they have footage of Hitler speaking there, and that yeah. must have, yeah. I don't know, just a... Yeah, they push it, but... Uh, so which which ship did you come back to the States on then? Queen Elizabeth. And, and what was that like? Oh, 18,000 men on there, you know. And they had the dining hall in there. 2,000 men sat down there at one time to eat. Well, uh, I, had a, we, I had a regular state room there was two of us in. But then we had to pull KP in the sh on that, go down to the kitchen, all the... You'd go in where a table was, and you had a table, and two of us on that table, and you'd get a, like for breakfast, they'd have, uh, bring out a big dishpan full of toast and butter and jam, and then boiled eggs and bacon. And then they had a big pot of coffee or tea, see? And that was it. You could take all the boiled eggs, and they said to take extra long, you know, for two meals, and then at night they'd have a regular, everybody ate out of their mess gear. They'd put 2,000 men through there in 45 minutes. And still eating out of your... Yeah. Then you got to get out of there. Yeah. Every... <laughs> that was something, too. I mean, um, uh, you know, that's where... As I learn more about this, where war becomes a, a very surreal thing, because, yeah, there there was a lot of bad, but yet there were people that were yeah. living their lives. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's totally different than I would have imagined it as I've talked to people that were actually there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've heard the travesties. I've talked to yeah. to big Marines that I just see them break down because of what they saw. Some in the South Pacific, especially yeah. in the, the abuse. But um, well, there was one uh, place in Italy. There, the uh, fifteen thousand Germans were in this valley, and our reconnaissance, you know, the Cub planes uh, uh, tra found them. And then they called planes, and the artillery opened up. And we went, uh, not by it, but just off here, and we were just stopping there. And, 
and guy walking engineering, and uh, he was a bulldozer man. And he said, I said, what are you doing in there? I'm putting in the bridge? No, he said, they shot up 15,000 Germans in there, I think, and they killed about 12,000 of them, he says, in there. They're just laying all over. And so we're just going to dig a trench about a half a mile long and just shove them in there. So that must have been one hell of a mess in there. But man, that's, I'll tell you some of them battles, like uh, before the Siegfried line there, we used, we used, with the triple nickel, was an eight inch guns, our guns, were shooting at that Siegfried line just ricocheting. And by God, after they got done, the Germans brought their guns out of that Siegfried line and <laughs> backed us, we had to leave, it's got so hot. Man, sometimes them shells, you know, they, it tough, them big ones come in. You know, they can really raise hell with you. Yeah, it's no fun there, I'm telling you. It scares the shit out of you when they come close. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's what, well, especially yeah. where you would end up a lot of times because you'd have the Germans, you'd have the yeah. offshore, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. you would be in the middle, and who is going to fire a little short? Yeah, yeah. That, it's like this colored guy says, you know, he says, uh, all you got to do is give them German your address, and they'll put her in the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we look, yeah. Another uh, about that. With remember that point system I was talking about. Uh, we talked to this one colored guy. We asked him how many points you got. Hell, he says I don't have enough to cross the Rhine. <laughs> yeah, you know stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Did yeah. you travel with the, the the same guys most of the time? Yeah. Because now you, it sounds like you didn't face as many casualties. As... Oh yeah, we had a lot of replacements. Oh, you did. Yeah, yeah. Because the strafers come through there one time, uh, at a, me and another guy was just outside the gun, and here come this strafer playing German uh, measurement, and man, I, you know, you lay straight with the plane, because otherwise if you lay cross, you're going to get hit. Man, them old bullets were just coming both sides of it. The other guy got wounded. We had, <coughs> on Angio, I guess we lost eight men, and we got replacements naturally. But this one guy got hit in the knee, and then he went to the hospital, which was... Uh, Oh, a mile or so from us or more. I don't know where it was at. He got there and he got shelled in there and lost an arm and everything. God sakes. Because, you know, they had guns right outside the hospital. You couldn't blame the German. Yeah, there was no place to go. Four by ten ain't very big beachhead when you got thousands of men. You know how many uh, anti aircraft guns we had on NGO and that little 450? Wow. So you imagine we had a lot of air raids. Every day and every day, just every dive. And our planes would be up there fighting them, and then the shells dropping like hail stones, the empty shell cartridges, fighting up there. See, but they'd have to come from southern Italy, I mean, the bases. And the minute that they would change, and the new set of planes would come in, them Germans were there. How in the hell they knew that, I don't know. Huh. Yeah, they were there, giving us hell, strafing every, they'd come out, at night, just when the sun is down, come out of the sun at you, see? So you... They knew, yeah, you couldn't see them. Yeah, then, you know, every damn machine gun in that beachhead was opened up. That was a racket, I tell you, there, son. And then at night, two of them flares up front on the no man's land in there, you could read a newspaper. Then Germans would drop flares, you could read a newspaper. <laughs> then here, bench, you know, you're laying in your foxhole, you hear that old, you know... And you just wait till he goes over, and then you try to get to sleep in time. You turn around another one there. God damn it! Just, just harass you. What, what's the longest time you spent in a foxhole? That was four months there. Four months. From the 29th of January till the 23rd of May. Not quite four. So were you were, never moved? I mean, food? Did they? Uh, they brought it out at night. There were sea rations. Never, not till quite after, till it got pretty well settled, see. But not for the first two months. It was pretty hot there. So somebody make a run and almost kind of like feeding the animals. Yeah, they would yeah. throw some food into your foxhole and. No, no, we. See, you had to get out of the foxhole to go to the gun. See, you know, you got your. Uh, well, we had to have a full crew from sunrise to sunset, and you got eighteen men, and a half a crew from dark until the morning. So now you draw up the schedule. You know, the full crew was just about all of them. So you'd go on shift and you'd go up to your gun, yeah. and then you'd come back into your foxhole off a shift. Yeah. What do you do in a foxhole all that time? Well, you can't do nothing. Well, you try, you get out sometime. You, 
what the hell are you going to do? You can move around a little bit, but the minute the shells come, you go back in. They don't shell all the time. You know, they pick streets in, in certain time, and then they'll pick a certain coordinates, the Germans on the end, so they didn't. Uh, but they shell them guys off in that woods there every day. Jesus, they got her. So did you have like a little candle in your foxhole? Or? Oh, yeah, we had, you're, yeah. You're hidden, so the white's not coming out yeah, that way. You, but. Yeah, yeah, you're hidden, and you got your tarp and canvas and everything over there. You pick up old tents, you know, shelter halves and... Hell, there's also an army and stuff loot laying around all over. When you go through the, you know, when on the big push, when you go through the front of there's stuff laying all over. God. If you, if you didn't have it, you could find it somewhere. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. So are you yelling back and forth to, I mean, you're sitting in a fox. It just seems like you would get, I mean, after you got over the initial, oh, my yeah, God, yeah. I'm going to get blown up. Yeah, yeah. Then the, you're sitting there for eight hours or yeah. whatever. Are you, how are you communicating back and forth to everybody, and you know who's doing what and where? Yeah, well, they, they're all around there. You you get to talk to them and everything else, you know. When you get on the gun, you sit and talk. Hell, you, you talk for four months, you got nothing else to talk about, you know? Same guys. Well, they, you know, they get on the, like there, you get on the on the guns, see, say that uh, full, during the day you got maybe 12 men. All in that gun, see? Well, there was two of them in the, on the fifty caliber, but there were ten of them on the main gun, see? And, uh, the, well, you talk, and uh, and and then you're so tired, maybe uh, keep two of them awake, the rest guys would doze off, you know, un unless an air raid come. Yeah, we had one guy tracking on there. He fell asleep right there in the air raid. He was so tired. You know, there's nothing worse than tired. When you're so damn tired, what are you going to do? I know. It, uh, God damn it. Uh, and you, when you hit that foxhole, you, hell, you slept right through the air raids and everything after a while. You know, you get so tired, what the hell. You just, some of them just didn't give a damn. If they're going to get her, they're going to get her, you know, they said. And, and Got no control. No, you, yeah. What kind of, I, I guess that's kind of interesting. What, what, talk, what did you guys talk about? I've heard different people tell different things. A lot of people talk about food back at home, what they miss. Oh, what oh they, yeah, I guess, and, oh, well, it, everybody talked about everything, the war, every. We'd pick up, uh, we had a radio, they would pick up the BBC in London, on the, you know, and then we'd hear, the, they'd give us the dope, of, you know, boy, and we'd talk about the Russian front, the Russians are coming, you know, and, and boy, oh, how many miles they advanced, but, and we was waiting for D-Day, D-Day so damn long, you know, God, we was over there a year before they ever invaded, you know, yeah. So you guys all knew it was coming. Yeah, oh yeah, we knew she was coming, but we didn't know when. But we just, we took Rome, you know, that should have been the big headlines. But hell, D-Day was the next day, so that was all it. They got all our headlines, you know. <coughs> that was it. See, otherwise we'd have had, you know, it would have been a big headline the stage, Rome taken, you know. But, but we parked right aside of that big coliseum. We looked at, looked at that thing, you know, it was all crumbled rock, and, you know, you know. Well, Italy, them people... Italy, you know, they're no fighters of Italians. They one Germans were the hunter of them. <laughs> you know, I thought, you know, yeah. Now, I had one gentleman that I interviewed from, from Summer Lake, though, that he told me that, that, that Italy was good for uh, the oldest occupation in the world. He said there were some cat houses. That, oh. <laughs> and this guy went on and on about oh. There was cat houses all over. Uh, like in Italy, uh, north of Naples, the uh, girls would come out in buggies. A regular horse or buggy like the old days, you know, them buggies. Hell, it'd be 10, 12, 15 of them roaming around the woods there getting the guys. <laughs> but you take in in uh, Algiers, this guy, they had a horse, they had 250 horses. And, and man, just thick rubs and rugs in there. Yeah, they're right down to Algiers. But hell, you couldn't get near that. The MP, P's were in, yeah. But some of them uh, units in Italy, some outfits there, they have the, the horse inspected by the uh, doctor of the company, and they held them guys all there. They, sure, they had them legal. But our captain didn't allow that, so, you know. U USDA approved. Yeah, yeah, God, yeah. They, it was something. Huh, that's, yeah. that's War won't stop certain things, I guess. But after uh, after the war, you know, they, hell, there was uh, 15 uh, women to one man in Germany. You know, they was all killed. The Germans lost a hell of a lot of men, you know, in, in there. So there, it was just, gee. Well, I went back over in Germany after the war three more times. See, I retired from the service. And then they, uh, 
but I looked it all over three more times. I, I had some experiences after the war over there too. Yeah. I was, so you, you, after the war, you didn't get out. You stayed in. Yeah, I stayed out for a little while. Then I went back. Then I went, I went over to Japan for five years. I was over there when that Korean War broke out. I had my bags on the truck to go, and they called my name out to stay back. And I was in the infantry regiment, and I worked at S four. And I got off the guns. I, I got in the supply business after that. I did one no more of the guns. Did he? Yeah. An interesting thing for a lot of the veterans I've talked to is is that their lives are this long. Yeah. World War Two was. Yeah. This much, but yet, what they came away from World War Two with has been so powerful for their life. What it's done to their life, whether it's friends they met, experiences they've had. Yeah. Did 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 you? The people you served with, did you get to know them, or were you in the, the one of the regiments that is like, I don't want to get to know anybody because who knows when? Well, I knew a few of them, not too many. You see, we got replacements, and I didn't get, but the sergeant was the act, I knew him. Yeah, but other, after the war, I don't know what happened to him, you know. Did you, did you, uh, um, did you have contact with home? I mean, here you are out in this foxhole, are you getting mail? And oh, things? yeah, mail once in a while, yeah. But I was over in Sicily, and my aunts and aunt all sent me uh, uh, 15 packages I had coming over and never got one, all got sunk. And, my, my, and, and you know, I, I laughed. These are good when I asked about some, uh, I said, boy, I'm very sick of dehydrated potatoes. That Jesus, she didn't turn around and send me six potatoes. <laughs> okay? I, but in, in Sicily, I didn't smoke. So I had a duffel, half a duffel bag full of cigarettes, you know, to give you a pack a day. And I traded 14 of them there for a big turkey. And we had a Chinese cook that, you know, the guys would pick on him. And I never picked on him, you know, I felt sorry for the guy. And I agreed. So he cooked there and we invited him over to the gun. Captain, come, we had a very good captain, so we brought him over. He came over and, and uh, we had a nice turkey feed. Man, that was good, yeah. But I, I gave the other guys some cigarettes too, but I traded for some stuff in Sicily and uh, sent it home in Italy, you know, that I had, you know, I sent some nice stuff home. I could, you know, you didn't want, it wasn't too much that, that you could, you know. But one time, in, I'll tell you, one time in Italy we were going and we stopped at this place and up in the hill was a big villa. So we went up there and asked for some wine, you know, and so the guy here, he had some. So it got to be about 9, 10, or 11 o'clock and I think there were three of us, so we was coming out and had to just go down the hill, there was our gun. And they had some small trees like cedar all close together. We pushed our way through there. The hell, this one guy stepped down soft dirt. What the hell is this? God damn it, he scratched around, he fell down. God damn it, he says there's something in there. So he, he run down, he got two goddamn shovels, he come back and we shoveled. Here was two great big chests. See, we got some of the other guys went back and dug them two chests up. We couldn't lift them. We dragged them down that goddamn hill. Next morning, we got march order, you know, loaded them on our truck, hit them, and then we went, got to the next spot there and set up our gun, and then evening, nobody around, and we opened them goddamn things up. The fascist boots were in there and, and lace and silverware, but... Uh, I don't know, some guy took the silverware, I guess, in that, but otherwise all lace dollies and, uh, and every, fascist boots. And that guy must have been a pretty, uh, at least a fascist party in that. So uh, so we just set him off, and, and then the uh, lady come by, old lady come by, and said, here, we, here, take what you want. She took a lot of it. Another guy, he took some, you know, he gave it. <laughs> so we just hit the old box and moved on. We never heard that. Well, we all could have been court martyred. <laughs> Yeah, hey, not at all. Yeah, but what, what was the best part of being in the in the service? Oh, the best part was well, I don't know. The best was uh, the war. Was, well, at least I seen lots. I never would have seen what I did see. You know, that part of it is, I you know, I mean the whole service. I mean, not counting the war. Well, the war you can't get where you want to get. You know, because it's restricted. You know, you got to go where they tell you to go. Yeah, heck, this one sergeant, you know, he got court-martialed there in Italy because they told him to go on this hill. And as he was moving up to the hill, the Germans were shelling that hill awful heavy. 
By God, they court martialed for neglect of duty for not going in. But he might have lost six men or more. No, I didn't think that was right. But when you get ordered, you got to go, I guess. You know? Do, God damn, that was, that was a awful move, you know? Do you but, think that there's a, a, a message for the generations to come, the kids that we'll never meet, yeah. that, that, that they should remember about World War II? Well, I say one World War Two. If Hitler would got a power look, it would have been an awful war. He almost had her. Yeah. I think he would have had her if he uh, could have got England. I think if he'd have had Hitler and got that atomic bomb, you know, he was working on her and his rockets, and and he was way ahead of us on the missiles. You know, well, we got all the Germans come over for our missile program. You know that. That's for true. So if he if he Hitler would have listened to his generals, he'd have won that war, but he didn't. You know they'd have never invaded if he'd listened to his generals. They'd have pushed him back, because he had two hundred thousand men up in Calais there, and they would yeah. Uh, but he didn't listen, and another he didn't he didn't have no business going to uh, Africa. You know if he'd have stayed out of Africa and went down through uh, uh, the other side there, you know, to Turkey and got into that oil, he'd have been better off. See, they, we captured about 250,000 Germans in Africa. They brought them all from the States, you know, the States. I know my uncle, he lived in Shikton, and they had a big sauerkraut factory there. And there was 12 Germans working there for him, you know. And he could talk good German, you know, and, and he talked to them, and, and they thought when they come to the States, they'd see it all bombed up. But they were so surprised to see it, and, and, and then they knew that Germany never had a chance. You know, and all 12 of them, they had to go back when the war ended, you know, that was the order. But all 12 come back to the States. Huh. You know, it's a, I don't know how they got it, I suppose through immigrants, yeah. But they liked it so good and, but the uncle said, man, them guys really worked, they eh? was good workers, you know, they had good, you know. That's yeah. interesting to think. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 few changes here or there, and it would have been a yeah. whole different... Well, I don't think it's the ordinary. Ordinary people got along good. But it was just them big wigs, you know. That's all it is, like Sudan. If they'd get rid of him, you know, one... There's only about five or six of them in this world today that has got to be wiped out. And when the U.S. wouldn't allow them uh, to kill them, guys like that, you know, it's not... They should just get rid of them. Because they cause more... Look at what Hitler caused, how many deaths, huh? I went through a couple of them concentration camps too. Look, that stink, and man, oh man, that was terrible. Yeah. That's uh, a, yeah. a couple of the guys say that, that yeah. Uh, yeah. they ended up uh, in Dachau. Yeah, yeah. And, Munich, uh, one I went, yeah. He said that they would talk about anything before that. He said they went in, and when they went out, they would still talk about anything, but none of them ever talked about that just because it was so. Yeah. Yeah. Overpowering to Yeah, them. yeah. Some of them guys that couldn't even move, you know, them Jewish people were just, when they seen the GIs, just, you know, it's stories there that was, got that infantry went in there, you know, and just took what they could, you know. God, some, some of them little kids, you know, they didn't, in Italy there, it was so poor, they didn't have nothing to eat. You know, but we had a good captain, and he told us uh, he had uh, coffee cans up, you know, and he says, uh, if you don't mind, he says, uh, you, it's up to you if you want to put your half a piece of bread in there or what you got left or in a can, but don't throw it all in one, just keep it separated, and then we'll give it to the kids if they want it. By the first day we had about 12 kids, or the next day we had about 50, you know. They were, just to get anything, you know, it, it, it just a cry and shame, you know. But then, you know, like I said, that laundry lady would come and do your laundry just for a little piece of soap. Then she'd always have one or two little ones with her, you know. Well, a guy had a little candy bar or uh, some of them lifesavers or, you know, you have that. And give them to man. That, that would just, you know, because I know I come out of a big, we didn't have much during the Depression either, you know. So I, I, I saved them. I gave it to them, you know. They were so happy to get it, yeah. But I, uh, we went through Bingham, Germany. So I was on the gun there one day. And, this German lady come by and talking, and her husband was the captain of the Graf Spee that was down there in Argentina. 
Yeah. So uh, she uh, talked, I talked with her, and, and she, I asked her how her husband, well, he's in turn down there, she says, till the war is over, and everything and that, and, and everything, you know, but she said she was getting along pretty good in that, but huh. she didn't, yeah. Wow. But there was a, a big cognac factory there. So <laughs> I went over to there, talked to that guy, I had a couple of packs of cigarettes, and uh, talked to him, <coughs> hey, I said, how about a pack of, how about some cognac? Now trade your bottle of cognac for a bottle of that. Yeah, okay. He said, so then we was there about, oh, four or five. But, oh, I was going to tell you about that in, in Bingham story, what we heard there. Uh, they, uh, a British uh, pilot was shot down. He landed in that town, on the edge of town, and then people in the town come and stoned him to death. The British intelligence, the story goes, that they got word of it, see. So then, uh, years, about a year or so later, our bombers, and I mean the British bombers, used to always cross that area and go there. So this one day, they didn't, they opened up their cargo box and just bombed that with the big blockbusters. They blew that train engine about four blocks from the depot. You, with them big, powerful bombs, yeah. They just pulverized that town to get even with that, for Stone and that pilot. They knew the British, and them British were good secret servicemen. They they had good intelligence. See, they broke, they broke that German code, yeah. yeah. So they were really sharp, I get it, you know. But they, yeah. But I had five bottles of cognac anyway there, all told. <laughs> so I kept two till the war ended, you know. And then uh, when the war ended, we were close to Czechoslovakia there, all sitting around about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And then we heard the rumor of surrender, and the captain called up. I mean, the rumor to come down from the first sergeant, no drinking. Yay, right. Five minutes later, the phone's ringing again. Drink if you got her. <laughs> yeah, well, he took a couple snorts, passed our bottle around, and yeah. But we carried a goddamn whole... Uh, Big, uh, in Germany, had a big uh, barrel of wine right on our truck. Yeah. yeah. We, right, when we was at Oppenheim, right down in there, they had a cellar, a wine cellar, must have had a million bottles in there. Yeah. We had one guy from Connecticut, he'd go down there every day with a gunny sack, bring up five, six bottles of that wine, and he'd volunteer for guard that night. Sit there and drink all night long. <laughs> every day he did that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. We wasn't there too long, though, you know. Never, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. And we had another guy from Florida, old Romney Taylor. He could smell beer or booze wherever there was. I'd laugh. We was in Germany there, you know, and nobody get nothing to drink. Yeah, there and old Romney go in his duffel bag, come out with a bottle of wine. Where in the hell do you get that? I don't know. But right across the street from us, there was a German house with a. Old uh, lady about middle age there with about two broken front teeth, you know, poking her head out the window all the time. He said, she's the one that give me the wine. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he must have slip, been slipping over her night or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. It's quite a story, you know. Uh -huh. hmm? He had some real good, yeah. But it was uh, something to see. But I was glad to get home. You know, it was a long grind. That had to be uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. hard on your parents, yeah. having lost your brother and then have Now, were there just two boys in your family? No more. My younger brother couldn't go because he had a heart tremor. And uh, Zook, the one the older than I am, he was born crippled. He couldn't go, yeah. But, uh, well, yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, oh, when I got home, you know, he had a report to that draft board guy within eight or ten days. See? Well, I was one of the first ones in my hometown from the war because I had a September. The war didn't end with at September something, didn't it? Second or third? The well, Japanese surrendered, I guess, official. Well, I got home the 15th. I landed, and I know I got home the 19th. I landed in New York. And uh, so and then I come home and uh, meet another guy. He was from the Pacific. So we went up to him, and he said, we got to sign the papers. So we walked into his office there, Ogarski. He says, I see you guys got a diploma. I says to Garski, I said, you remember me? I'm that Zaisky boy. 
that you said was trying to get out of the army. I said, take a look at that. I said, them goddamn six battle stars ain't nothing to sneeze at. I says, I wish to Christ you'd have been on the end of that rifle. I says, you'd have been deader than hell. He looked at me so funny, you know. I says, they told me that they never thought there was a man like you in, in the United States, colonels and generals both. I says, so oh, I says, now how, how you feel, see. So he didn't say that. He said, you got to sign here. I said, I ain't signing not a goddamn paper. We never did sign, <laughs> you know. But he uh, he was crooked because I had two cousins. They run off to a farm and they didn't have to go. You know, he's crooked in hell. That, yeah, it was that. <coughs> it pulled a lot of that stuff. Did he remember you? Yeah, oh, yeah. Did he remember what? Yeah. Oh, yeah, when yeah. he knew, yeah, he had to remember me because uh, then later on that time, I mean, this, this guy was in the tavern or... And here, uh, he says, here comes old Garsky, let's give him a little scare. <laughs> we went out and, and we come out of the tavern looking at Hey, you old crook, and he says, he cut across the street. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But, yeah, my dad and mother even said that he wasn't fair, you know. I mean, it was, well, as long as he had gone that far, we had no use going back home and, 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 and on, in a way. But the Army did good, yeah. So you proud of your of your service? Oh yeah, I did good. Yeah, I stayed in. And, you know, I got the commendation ribbon. You know, to, from the army. And but I was over in Europe after the. When you remember that Czech uprising, I was there, that time. And then when they went through to Berlin, remember when they were going to push the tanks? I was there that time too, and uh, then I was stationed on. I went down to the 485th Engineers, and. All we had was 75 trucks of TNT with five ton on each truck. And we were scattered all along that Danube River there. And we had a like Dagendorf, there was 10 men there that had a suicide. That's all it was. Just take that five ton truck, set it on the bridge, and set the fuse and get the hell out. And all along, that's our job. And I. Was, I worked in S4, and I was in charge of all that TNT every day. I had to go to the ammo. It comes every day. You get a slip of paper down with numbers that you have to rotate that. See, it's old TNT, and you get the new. So uh, that was my job always, to uh, go out there every day to the ammo dump. I went out uh, ammo dump one day. Here come old Jumpin' Jim Gavin, the old big four-star general. Shook hands with me, got he tall, big guy. Yeah, he got it. He said, Sergeant, you're right on the wall. Do a good job, tanks. It's a good job, he says. He did. Keep up the good work, and uh, well, uh, our colonel was with him. Yeah, he says he keeps that uh, TNT right up to snuff. Well, he said that's the way it should be, you know. And he just took off, you know. But they, God damn it, oh, some, that outfit was always some big shots coming down there in Regensburg. I was at Regensburg, you know. But we, we was right, I was right on the Danube, looked over across, could see them Russians there all the time. A lot of times we went to the outpost, I did, yeah. Yeah, them guys, 15 minutes they had to get out of there, rest, dressed and get them, yeah, yeah, see, that was almost as bad as war itself, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, so, it, yeah, but I like Germany, is it nice good beer there? I, I was just going to say, I know exactly why you <laughs> like Germany, yeah, huh. yeah. well, 